Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm so excited because today's guest is a High Point University graduate. She is currently getting her master's degree to become a child life specialist. She's going to share her story of how her challenges in her life have pushed her to continue to help others. She has an amazing attitude and always has a smile on her face. So if we could please welcome Kat Kurban. Yeah. Me. So Kat, since graduation, what have you been up to? Um, so after graduation, I took a year because I knew I wanted to apply to this pretty competitive uh, master's program here in Boston. And in order to apply, I needed to complete a certain number of volunteer hours in the hospital. Um, and it's the master's program is specifically to become a child life specialist and work with pediatric patients um, in healthcare settings. And so I needed to work underneath a certified child life specialist um, in order to apply to the program. So I took the year and I volunteered at uh, Boston Medical Center, which is a city hospital in Boston. And then the other one was a small called Shriners Hospital um, in Boston that primarily treated uh, burn survivors. And so I took the year and I took more psych classes because my undergrad, as you can remember, was communication and graphic design focused, um, not really in the child development or early education track that most child life specialists are. Um, so I took some child development, child psychology classes during my year off. And then I started my master. I got in and I started my master's program um, this past fall. Well, congratulations. That's Thank awesome. And so what sort of drove you to go in this direction? I knew I, I was always interested in healthcare. I remember watching like medical examiner shows when I was little, like that's what I would want to watch. <laughs> um, but I, science and science does not come naturally to me. And the idea of being um, in charge of life or death situations like a doctor or nurse, like that terrifies me. Um, I'm more interested in the patient interaction aspect of it. So originally I thought maybe I'd do public relations um, for a nonprofit or a hospital and have that aspect of healthcare in there, but not be in charge of prescribing anything or saving lives. <laughs> um, and then after my freshman year at High Point, I got really sick and had my own. Well, we can get into that after. Yeah, uh, you can go into it now, too, about just talking about your challenges, because that is, I, I can imagine, what really yeah. drove you in, in this direction, too. Yeah. Okay, so backstory is I dislocated my shoulder and it was out, like in and out, constantly dislocating for a month. So I needed a couple years of PT before I could get surgery to tighten everything back up. And when they said I was cleared for surgery, it was when I was about to move down to North Carolina to go to school. And so we had to delay it a year and I continued PT at school and I finished finals early and this uh, surgery was scheduled for middle of April and I got in, the surgery was successful, but for some reason, and we don't really know ultimately what caused what and what happened when, but, uh, I couldn't keep anything down for about a month after the surgery. And I ended up getting, uh, admitted to the hospital. I had a feeding tube and I had pancreatitis that wouldn't go away. So they needed to start to rule things out, as they say, to figure out why my pancreatitis wasn't going away, which if you don't know, pancreatitis is the um, swelling or inflammation of the pancreas. And the protocol they were assuming for me was once I had the feeding tube inserted, that my uh, number markers for the inflammation would start trending down, but they wouldn't. So that's why they needed to figure out if there was an underlying cause for this. So the first thing they decided to do was give me a sweat test, which is to test for cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic um, 
disease that most patients are diagnosed within the first couple of years of their lives. And the sweat test came back abnormal. And after some more digging and genetic testing, I got diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Um, and mine is considered atypical because I was diagnosed so late, but I do have two mutations. I'm, I qualify for gene therapy, so I'm on that now, which I'm very fortunate and grateful for. But that whole hospital experience and being a patient in a children's hospital, which I know, JT, you can um, relate to, opened my eyes to the world of child life, as we call it, and what a child life specialist can do for patients and families. And that's when I realized that I needed more patient interaction in whatever path I would go into than just um, public relations for a hospital. I really wanted to be yeah. there day to day and build relationships with patients and families. Awesome. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, obviously we see your challenges that you've, you have overcome and continue to overcome. And then also how it drove you into a field that can help so many other people. But what was sort of your thoughts and in, in how, you know, this is a, a time that you were so excited to be in college and, you know, going through this exciting new adventure of school and, and new friends and stuff. And all of a sudden you get hit with this and, and, you know, you have, there's a lot of uncertainty and, and things that you don't know. And how did you stay positive and apply yourself to school and friends? Um, so I was in the hospital the whole summer, pretty much on and off with the feeding tube in and out, um, had the feeding tube at home, had the feeding tube in the hospital. So it was really just learning to adapt to what was going on. Um, I made the decision with my doctors to, I mean, I wasn't 21 at the time, but drinking goes on in college where we were. <laughs> Spoil that. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if I can say that, but whatever. And as you can imagine, I'm not a shy person. So adapting to life in college without relying on drinking was fine for me because personally, I don't feel the need to do that in social situations like some people do. And that's totally fine. I understand that. But it was interesting how many people questioned why I wasn't drinking and that they couldn't just accept it. Like, oh, Cass not drinking. Like, oh, what's wrong? What's happening? I'm like, I'm doing this for my health. In some ways, some people would say sacrifice, but for you, it was, you know, to better your health and yeah. just because it's, it's, you know, it was important to you. Yeah. And I also realized, um, now having or now knowing about this invisible illness, as we call it, because when you look at me, you can't tell that I'm quote unquote sick um, and that everyone really has something going on. Everyone is going through their own struggles and how important it is to remember that and be mindful of that. Everyone could be going through their own battles that you know nothing about. I love that quote. I just messed it up, but it's something along the lines wow, of that. That's an awesome quote. Going through everything I went through really, I think I had to grow up faster than most and I got a new perspective on things. So I knew what was important and I knew, I don't know. I just think I grew up faster, got a different perspective, but I really couldn't have gone back to school without having such a great support system at school. I lived my sophomore year. So I went back to school a little late. Um, I got my feeding tube out. I remember like the day classes started. Um, but I lived with seven other girls in my sororities and, and most of them were seniors and they were just incredible, always helping me, always offering to drive me to class because my energy was still super low and never pressuring me to do anything, but just always being there and they were just so supportive of me. And the whole school was just, I don't know. If I, I don't think if I had gone to any other school, I would have been able to go back and be as successful as I was. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, they were so supportive of you and, and everything that you did. And, uh, but I think that that's in return to just how you present yourself and how you, you know, bring that towards so many other people. And, 
And I think also like that really shows in your philanthropy that you do and that you've applied um, to your life and having such an important part um, of that in you is, is being philanthropic to others. I grew up, my family is very much involved in nonprofits. My dad uh, used to do medical missions for children and we grew up helping in those missions. I used to assist him in surgery. Uh, and I don't know, it was just always a part of growing up. Like we, it's just how I grew up to always help others when we can. And that remembering that everyone has their own story and what you see is not necessarily what's going on with them. You have no idea if someone screams at you, what could be going on that led them to scream at you. I think people are very fast to judge immediate circumstances without taking a deeper look into why people are feeling the need to take something out on you, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, you know, with going through all these challenges and, and tough times, um, and just having such a positive attitude that you always display and a smile on your face, what's, what's some advice that, um, you could give to others, uh, going through a tough time? I get that question a lot. I think I try and be positive because for me, I know that I'm so fortunate and I'm so grateful for all the support and all the, like I live in Boston, which is one of the medical capitals of the world. Like how lucky am I to have gone to the number one children's hospital and to have figured this out and have such great doctors and a family that supports me and friends who love me and all of that. So I've been so blessed that who am I to view this negatively? But on the other hand of that, I think that we all need to realize that no one can be positive all the time. Everyone is going to have bad days. And my advice is to feel what you need to feel. Like yesterday I was feeling pretty down and I just needed to see why I was feeling down and what was making me feel this way and really process it. And then once I did that, you know, I let it out and I move on because there's nothing I can change about the circumstances right now, especially with Corona. It's been like, um, for me personally, very anxiety inducing, but so much is out of my control. So once I process those feelings and realize that there's nothing I can do to change this pandemic that we're in, there's, it's not really useful for me to be in that mindset anymore if I can't do anything about it. And so since you brought up coronavirus and what's going on right now, what's, um, I mean, what's some advice that you have for, for people, um, during this time? Yeah, I think similarly to, you never know what's going on with someone, you never know what's going on with someone. So if I think a lot of people are judging others for like taking toilet paper and whatever in the grocery store, but you have no idea who they could one be getting that for two, who they have in their family or three, if they're suffering from something themselves, I think we all, the world could always use a little more compassion. Um, and really in this state where like state of the world, where so much is out of our control, the number one thing we can do is stay home and try and stop the spread of infection, wash our hands, practice social distancing, because a lot of people don't realize that even if they don't think they will get very sick, it passes on to so many people who can be very sick. So like I'm, for example, high risk for this infection because of lung disease. And a lot of people wouldn't realize that by looking at me, I'm young, I'm not in the age bracket for where um, I would be considered high risk by my age, but it's not like people have x-ray vision and can see my lungs or can see what's going on with my organs inside. It's, you know, it's true. Everyone should stay home and everyone should, you know, think about others. And I think compassion is the word that you used that really stands out. And it's not just compassion during this time, it's compassion all the time. And uh, just being able to apply that to our lives in general. And, you know, unfortunately, this is a tough time, but I think that it, it is bringing out the compassion in a lot of people. Something I always try to do is learn from any experience. 
Like, even if it was a bad experience, you can always take something away from it. Even if it's, wow, I really hated that. Like now I know that I hate that and I can move on from it. But I hope that people can take the time. And I think a lot of us, me especially, are trying to do everything they can because now they have all this time on their hands when really I read this article about how it's a a lot of what people are feeling right now is grief because our routines have stopped. We're not going on with our normal lives and any plans have been canceled right now. And we're really grieving through that process. So I think we need to give some compassion to ourselves and realize that this is a tough time and no one has been through this before that we're doing a lot, even if it's just staying home. Exactly. That's awesome. So you heard it there, compassion and continue to show that compassion. And thank you, Kat, so much for being on and uh, for sharing your story. And uh, we all have a story to share. And I think that it is so important that, you know, with us being able to share our stories, that we can, you know, be compassionate about others because you never know what's going on in their life. And, uh, and so thank you, everyone, for listening. And thank you, Kat, for being on. Thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button, leave a comment below, and smash that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.